where we're at is we're, we're learning about higher order differential equations. And in particular, you're going to see that basically the only thing that we have really much success with is the one we talked about at the very end last time. I know we only spent like a minute last time, but we're going to spend a lot of time, especially later this week. And that's where we have constant coefficients. So we have a, a, a linear constant coefficient, ideally homogeneous differential equation. We have a shot. So that's what we're going to get good at. Now, not everything we encounter has that form. So the first thing we we're going to talk about today is uh, a differential equation that looks bad, but we say, ah, we can change it to be one that is nice for us. So this is called the Euler equation. So we see it right here. AX squared Y double prime plus BX Y prime plus CY equals zero. So it's not constant coefficient. And uh, well, I mean, the reason is because the coefficients aren't constants. You know, that's you know, easy to decipher. Uh, but the, the punchline is we can turn it into one. And we do it by uh, sort of a, a, a strange idea, which is we're not making a, a substitution for our output. So we're used to doing things like, oh, substitute for y. We're making a substitution for our input. So we're going to say, all right, let's think of x as a new variable. And I might say, well, what do you mean by x? So when we write an equation like this, ax squared y double prime, there's kind of a little bit of hidden information. And the hidden information is, well, what do you mean by the derivative with respect to what? So in some sense, implicitly here, it's ax squared d squared y dx squared plus bx dy dx plus cy equals 0, where our derivatives are with respect to x. And so what we're going to do is change this from a differential equation which depends on x as its input variable to one that depends on a new variable. So we're going to call that new variable v. You can call it whatever you want. This is it's just a convention. And so the idea here, x equals e to the v. All right, great. No problem. Well, so what's y of x? Well, y of x is y of e to the v. I mean, that. all right, great. Now. How do you find dy dv? Well, if you want to take the derivative of this with respect to v, what rule do you need? Chain rule, right? Because there's e to the v inside the function y. So take the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. But e to the v has another name. What is e to the v known as? x. So that's where that x comes from, and dy dx is what we call y prime. Now if we want the second derivative of y with respect to v, what do we do? Well, the way we take a second derivative is we take a derivative of the first derivative. That's the idea. I mean, that's how derivatives work. If you want the second derivative, you take the derivative of the first derivative. If you want the third derivative, you take the derivative of the second derivative, and so forth and so on. So we say, okay, Great, we're going to take the derivative of this expression. Now, what rule do you need to take the derivative of dy dx product with e to the v? Product rule. I kind of gave it away the way I said it. So you take the derivative of the first, d squared y dx squared, times the second. Well, actually, we're not done yet. The derivative of dy dx, you have to use the chain rule. So that's where this other e to the v is. So this is. The derivative of dy dx is d squared y dx squared times the root of the inside, which is e to the v. And then, of course, there's still the e to the v there. And then the derivative, we keep the first the same, derivative of the second. That's where the dy dx e to the v comes from. So we simplify, say, OK, all the e to the v's become x's. So that's 2 e to the v's becomes x squared. There's y double prime. There is an x, and there's a y prime. So what does this all become? Well, we have the following. We start with this equation that we have. ax squared y double prime plus bx y prime plus cy equals 0. And then we do a little bit of rearranging. So 
this part downstairs, which has a times this expression plus b minus a times x bar prime plus cy, it is the same as that. Well, check it. See how you have a times xy prime? And here you have minus a times xy prime. So those cancel. So you're left with an a x squared y double prime b x y prime cy. So it's the original equation just slightly rewritten. And the reason it's slightly rewritten is we want it to match. So in particular, we see, aha, x squared y double prime plus xy prime, that becomes d squared y dv squared. Similar, xy prime, which we see here, and which we see there, becomes dy dv. And y, and uh, no mystery, mystery on this one, becomes y. Great, well, that was easy. And what's the, what's the moral here? Look, no variables. Life is good, solve. We have tools. And then once we solve it in terms of E, go back to X. So that's the idea. Now you might have been listening to me talk for a few minutes and say, wait a second, Steve. There's a better way, isn't there? What's the other way? Do you remember this? We did do things like this before. Way back in week one. So, I know, week one. That was a long time ago. That was like, I don't know, some number of weeks ago? All right. So, alternative. If you don't like this idea, this is one where we said, hey, let's guess y equals x to the r, solve for r. And this has a very similar flavor. It, there's some weird things that happen, though. And one of the weird things that happens is things like, how do you deal with repeated roots? It's not so clear, not so clear. But we know how to deal with repeated roots. And so that's why it's a little bit easier to transform it into a setting where you say, look, we have a, the whole story. We have the whole story when we have something that's constant coefficient. And so if we can put it into that setting, life is good. A lot fewer surprises. Okay, so let's do an example. Solve 9x squared y double prime plus 3xy prime plus y equals 0. All right, I guess the first question. Is this an Euler equation? Yeah, it has the right form. Essentially, you have powers of x going up with your derivatives. You know, no derivatives, no x. One derivative, power of x to the 1. Two derivatives, power of x to the 2. All right, well, look. The thing is, we can just jump straight to here. We don't have to rederive everything. So we say, aha, so this becomes, and we write things down. So the leading coefficient doesn't change. So that's 9 d squared y dv squared plus something dy dv. We'll come back to that one. And the last coefficient doesn't change. So plus y equals 0. So the question is, what happens here? Well, what's the rule say to do? <coughs> B minus A, where B is the middle term, A is the front term. So what goes there? What? Negative 6. And now, it's constant coefficient. Even though we've changed our variable to be v, it doesn't change our technique. It's the same idea. Our technique doesn't depend on what we call things. And so we're like, OK, great. Now, do you remember what to do when we have constant coefficients? Rhymes with schmolinomial. Yeah, there's a polynomial. Right? We turn it from a differential equation problem into an algebra problem. 
So we turn it into an expression that involves derivatives to one that involves finding roots, right? So what's the polynomial that would come out here? What happens to the 9? It becomes a 9. See how easy that is? Like the number becomes the number. The second derivative, what does that become? R squared. Now, R is nothing special about it. You can use any symbol. Uh, we want to avoid x because x has a different meaning. The minus 6 becomes? Minus 6. Isn't that so nice? Wow. It's like they want us to solve these problems. This first derivative becomes R. Now, what does, happens to this end? Plus 1. If you don't see a coefficient, there's really a hidden coefficient of 1 times y. And then y would be like r to the 0. Well, we just don't write that. So 9r squared minus 6r plus 1 equals 0. This looks like there's a question here. Uh, how did you get negative 6 for, the, for that first one? This negative 6. So this is a, b, c. So a, b, c. Our middle coefficient needs to become, uh, sorry, pointing in the wrong place, b minus a. b minus a. 3 minus, neg 3 minus 9, negative 6. Now, 9r squared minus 6r plus 1. Well, what do we hope to be true? That it factors. If you have nice instructors who actually check the problem ahead of time, it probably will. I hope I'm nice. I don't know. Maybe. Does this one factor? Yeah, how does it factor? 3r minus, minus 1 times 3r minus 1. Well, maybe. You can always check, right? 9r squared minus 3r minus 3r is minus 6r plus 1. Yeah, it works. So where are the roots? 1 third, 1 third. Repeated roots. All right, so now, next step. We're working on this differential equation, so we're going to write the answer to that differential equation. So it's some constant, e, and you grab the root. One third, what symbol comes next? It's v, because we're doing v as our variable. That's, that's what it's saying right there, the derivative with respect to v. Plus some constant, and now what? What? E? V. 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 And? E to the one third V. So repeated roots, remember, we're going to tell you this a couple of times, and at some point we'll probably justify it to you. That says, hey, if you have a repeated root, you've got to do something to say, look, if, see, if you covered that V up, so it just read, a e to the one third plus b plus b e to the one third b, we don't really have two solutions. It's the same solution written twice. So we don't have enough sort of f power, enough flexibility. So you have to do something to that second solution, and the thing you do is you multiply by b. All right, are we done? No, we're not done with the original problem. We are done with solving the modified problem. The one with the constant coefficient. So how do we finish the original problem? Substitute. Yeah, so we've got to get back what v, v in terms of x. So remember, this is when it helps to know what happened. So x was e to the v. Or, what can we say about v? Natural log x. Natural log x. Now, let's talk about e to the one-third v. What's another way to write e to the one-third v? And the answer is, well, there's a lot of ways to write that, Steve. You can do e to the v to the one-third. That's true. Is it helpful? What's another way to think of e to the v to the one-third? 
this becomes x to the one-third, because e to the v is x. So, a, x to the one-third, plus b, v is log x. And then e to the one-third v is again x to the one-third. So I'll put the log x in parentheses just to help separate. Now, are we done? Yes, yes, we're done, we're done. Good, done, done, all right. So, you know, this is a case where we could have gone x to the r, we would have gone that we have this repeated root, but the question is, well, what do you do with the repeated root in that case? Not so clear. Now we see, oh, log x, who knew? Well, somebody did. All right, good, any questions? All right, so in some sense that log x means repeated root. Okay, well, a quick example, which will probably take 20 minutes. No, no, come on, we'll be optimistic. So given that x, x log x, and x squared are solutions of x cubed, y triple prime, minus x squared y double prime plus 2xy prime minus 2y equals zero, show these solutions are linearly independent. Now, before we start, what kind of differential equation do we have here? Just on a side note. What is this? It's an Euler equation. It's the kind we just talked about. The only difference is this is third order we don't actually need to know that to solve it. I'm just saying, oh, it's a third order. And so it's not too surprising that we see x log x. That probably means that one of the roots is repeated. So, okay, all right. Now, we don't need to verify these are solutions. How do we know that we don't need to verify that these are solutions? It doesn't ask us to. Isn't that like, wow. If it doesn't tell you to do something, don't do it. On the other hand, the converse is also true. If it tells you to do something, then you should do it. do it. Okay, good, all right, good, all right. But it does say show these solutions are linearly independent. Okay, so how do we show things are linearly independent? What's our linear independence checking tool? The Ronskian, yeah. So if you see something saying, hey, <clears throat> so these are linearly independent. We're pulling out the Ronskian. It's our go-to tool. All right. So the Ronskian of the three functions x, x log x, x squared. So the way you take the Ronskian is you say, all right, I know it functions, and so I'm going to make a matrix. I'll probably regret my choice of spacing, but that's all right. What goes in the first row? What goes here? Yeah, the functions. Whatever functions you put here, just run in there. x, x log x, x squared. Okay, second row, what are we going to be putting in? Derivatives. What's the derivative of x? One. What's the derivative of x log x? Some people are saying natural log x plus one. Okay. Where, where does all that come from? Yeah, product rule. The derivative of first is one times log x. That's your log x. x, derivative of log x is one over x. That's where the plus one. All right, what comes here? 2x. All right, good. Okay, next row, what are we going to do? Yeah, more derivatives. Derivative of 1, 0. Derivative of natural log of x plus 1, 1 over x. Derivative of 2x, 2. Okay, what goes in the next row? Nothing. How do we know to stop? 
Because it's all the space I gave. Okay, all right, that's... But what, how, how would you know to stop if you were doing this? Well, if you have three functions, that's three columns, you should also have three rows. So you go until you have something which is square. Same number of columns as same number of rows. All right? So we can stop here. We have three rows. Life is good. Okay, now, the wonderful question. Do you remember how to take determinants of three by three matrices? Okay, so maybe we should recall how to take determinants of three by three matrices. So there's two ways. Uh, okay, so here's how I do it. I like to do diagonals. So what we'll do is we'll do our down diagonals first. You multiply those together. See how it's do, do, do? You're just going downhill. What's x times log x plus 1 times 2? The answer will not surprise you. It's x times log x plus 1 times 2. Yes? So far so good? Well, that's one diagonal down. But there's more to come. All right, the next diagonal, I come here and start going down. And then I'm like, ah, I'm hitting this wall. What should I do? Wrap around and finish the diagonal. So x log x, 2x, 0. OK, so we also have that term. So plus x log x, 2x, 0. All right, last downward diagonal. We have x squared, hit the wall, wrap around, 1x. All right, so what does that give us? Well x squared times 1 times 1 over x. All right. We're halfway there. So, so far so good. Just go diagonals, and if you hit the end, wrap around and keep going. Now, we did it going down. Let's do the same thing going up. So we'll do up diagonals. So, we multiply 0 times log x plus 1 times x squared. Well, we're going to get something. But now the key. On the down diagonals, we add. These up diagonals, we subtract. And that's the big like, what? But as long as you remember that, you're in good shape. OK, now we go to our next one. And again, multiply up. We hit a wall, wrap around. So, and it, remember to subtract. So it'd be 1 over x, 2x, and x. And we go to the last one, 2. We hit the wall, wrap around. So it would be subtract 2 times 1 times x log x. All right, so this works for 3 by 3. It's kind of a generalization of 2 by 2. Do you remember how in 2 by 2, we would have that little 2 by 2, and you said, oh, you multiply down the diagonal, you add that, and then you, you go subtract in the other direction. So it's a nice generalization. Now the, the bad news is it stops being true at 3. That trick doesn't work for 4. The good news is we're not going to ask you to do 4. So, all right. So that is the determinant. But let's figure this out. We have to ask the question, is this 0 or non-zero? And it's not so clear what the answer is looking at this expression. So we should simplify. Are there any terms which simplify quickly? Yeah, the ones with 0 involved just go away really quickly. OK, that's good. What we can distribute. So we'd have 2x here times log x plus 2x. So that's the first term. x squared times 1 times 1 over x, also known as x. 1 over x times 2x times x, minus 2x. Minus 2 times 1 times x log x, minus 2x log x. All right. Well. Does anything simplify? 
2x log x's cancel. 2x's cancel. And what are we left with? X. So, are these linearly independent? Yes. This is not zero. So, linearly independent. Now, the skeptic in the audience, or perhaps I should say the troublemaker, the rabble rouser, will say, Steve, <laughs> that could be zero at x equals zero. Mm. You're a skeptic, you're a rabble rouser. We don't care about x equals zero, actually. Can you see why? It's a little subtle. It, it, it weaves a few ideas that we haven't maybe said out loud in a long time. It turns out that at x equals zero, what happens with your leading coefficient? Goes to zero. If your leading coefficient disappears, your differential equation breaks down and you basically lose information. So we, we already knew that zero was a place where our differential equation broke down, so we don't care what's happening at zero. So it's okay, no worries, no worries. Essentially, the punchline is for you, your, your real question is, is it not the zero function? All right, and so we're good, we're good. Now, do you wanna see the other way to take this determinant? Are you happy with just the one? Yeah, the other one works for bigger ones. Yeah. You're like, I signed up for differential equations, Steve, not for linear algebra. Just wait till after the first exam. It turns out you signed up for linear algebra. <laughs> uh, you just don't know it yet. Okay, so the, the other way to take a determinant is so, something called cofactor expansion. All right. So how does this work? Uh, do you want to do this exact one or should we do a slightly different one? Same one. Same one. Sure. That'll be convincing, right? It's saying, hey, if we get the same answer, Steve, then you probably know what you're talking about. All right, so here's the idea. You pick a row or you pick a column. Anyone have a favorite row or column? First row? Very. It's common to do the first row, no problems. And on a side note, I'm gonna put a little mysterious pattern here, which will make more sense as we go along. It's called the checkerboard pattern, where you have alternating plus minus. Okay, so here's the idea. It's actually really cool, and it's amazing that it works. We're gonna go along the first row. So we come to the first entry. It's called x, so we write x. And then what we do is we imagine crossing out the first row and crossing out the first column. And so using my you know, high-tech special effects, it's like, wow, what, what happened? Magic, okay. You have a smaller matrix left. And we write down that smaller matrix. So log x plus one, two x, one over x, Two. Now, we just do that across. Okay, so now it's x log x, and uh, so x log x. And again, imagine that we covered that up, and what you see is a, a smaller matrix. You see the 1, 0, 2, x, 2, and that's the matrix you write down. 1, 0, 2, x, 2. And I didn't plan well, so I'm out of space, but you go to the third entry, so you write down the third entry. And again, cross out the first row, third column, and you see a two by two matrix, and you write that down. So one, log x plus one, zero, one over x. Okay, now, these things are what are called the cofactors. With one small twist, I haven't told you about this. Wherever you pick your, your entries, you can pick any row you want, you can pick any column you want. So, pro tip, if you were picking rows or columns, which row or column should you look for? Things with zeros. We like zeros. Okay, but that's okay. First row is fine. And now the thing is, you follow the pattern here. 
Since we go along the first row, it's a plus, minus, plus. Plus, minus, plus. If we use the second row, minus, plus, minus. If we use the first column, plus, minus, plus. And that's it. So what the cofactor expansion does is it says, oh, it, you can take a 3 by 3 determinant and turn it into three 2 by 2 determinants. All right, well, let's see if it works. So we have x. Here, we know how to take a 2 by 2. So it's diagonal down, 2 times log x plus 1. Subtract diagonal up. 1 over x times 2x is 2. Subtract x log x. What's this determinant going to be? It's going to be 2, because you know this other diagonal goes away. Plus x squared and times this determinant. Well, what is that going to be? 1 over x, because the other diagonal goes away. So we end up with, well, you multiply this out, you'll get 2x log x plus 2x. Then you have minus 2x, minus 2x log x, plus x. And, well, fingers crossed, does anything nice happen? Things cancel, woo, except the x. So the determinant is x. So you get the same answer either way. All right. So that's cofactor expansion for taking determinants. All right, so again, you can pick the way you like. OK, are we done with this problem? No. <laughs> no. OK, because there's an also. Find the particular solution satisfying you have some initial conditions. Y of 1 equals 3, Y prime of 1 equals 2, Y double prime of 1 equals 1. Now, this sounds like work. That's OK. We're here for it. So what helps? why is the first part helpful in answering the second part? It said, show these solutions are linearly independent. How is knowing that, maybe not helpful in doing the second part, but in knowing that there is an answer to the second part? How does that help? Ah, philosophy, philosophizing. So we were given three solutions, and we're, we just showed that these are linearly independent. How does that help us know that we're going to succeed in what we're about to do? Sorry, what? Well, that there are solutions, but what can we do with these solutions? We can find other solutions by doing what? Superposition. Now, that says we know that there are solutions. Whoops. One big solution. B A times X, B X log X, and C X squared. Is there any other solution that's not covered by this? And why not? Well, the answer is no, because we, we know if we have linearly independent solutions and we have the same number of linearly independent solutions as the degree of, uh, well, the order of the differential equation, all solutions have to look like that. So every solution looks like this. So we're guaranteed that we can find the solution in particular that has some given initial conditions. Now we say, OK. Can we find the derivative? Well, yeah. In fact, we don't even have to think, because they're right there. So we can use things called copy. a times 1 plus b times log x plus 1 plus c times 2x. See, I just copied that row, because that's the derivatives. How about y double prime? Well, you get a times 0, so that's just gone b times 1 over x, and c times 2. 
All right, so now what happens next? Well, plug stuff in. So when we plug in one, we'll get A. What happens when you plug one into the middle term? You get zero, because log of one is zero. So A plus C, because one squared is one, equals three. Plug it into the for derivative. You'll get A, because A is always there. How about this middle term? What do you have? B. B. It was, well, log x will become log 1, which is 0, but you still have the plus 1. And then C times 2 times 1, which is 2C. 2C or not 2C? That is the question. Equals 2. Why double prime? Okay, there's nothing there. We're plugging in 1. We'll get B times 1 over 1 plus 2C. And that will equal 1. All right, so now we come to our system of equations. And here's a fun fact. In fact, we, we cover the details up because we don't often think about, well, because there's a, there's a small catch. Um, you're not always going to be able to succeed in solving systems like this, but here's the, the, the really cool fact. It turns out that this particular thing here isn't just anything. If you think about this, oh man, I don't, man, this is so cool, but we might spend a whole hour talking about this problem at this rate. Uh, if you think about what's going on here, if you are familiar with matrix notation, this can be written in the following format. You take the coefficient, so 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, and then the A, B, C, and that will give you 3, 2, 1. All right. Well, so uh, what's cool about that? Well, what's, uh, what's cool about this is this matrix here, this is the Ronskian at x equals 1. That's where it came from. And now there's always the question, can you solve? And so if you've had linear, linear algebra before, and, and some of you may have had, maybe not a whole course in it, but may have heard things about like inverses of matrices. And if you haven't, you will. It's coming. Uh, so anyways, the, it turns out if the determinant of this is not zero, you can solve. Do we know what the determinant of this is? It's one. Do you know how we know it's one without having to work really hard? Because we took the determinant for general x and said the answer is x. So since this is the wrong thing for x equals one, the determinant's one. Since the determinant is one, we're guaranteed there's a solution. So that's why we care about the Ronskin being zero versus non-zero. It comes down to solving these initial conditions. It says, hey, can you be guaranteed, can you be guaranteed to solve those initial conditions? All right, okay, so that's our, our side note for the day. Back to the problem. Three equations, three unknowns. Lots of ways to attack this. Anyone have a suggestion to start? Yeah, someone had noticed this. This should, look how these match. So we could subtract the bottom one from the middle one. If you did that, what would you be left with? Well, on the left-hand side, what would happen? Oh, yeah, eh? Yeah, sure, sure, yeah, eh? B's, the two C's would cancel, equals one. All right, A equals one. Can we use that to help us find anything? What does C has to equal? Two. two, from the first equation. Okay, you found A and C, can you find B? Okay, so we have B plus four equals one, so B has to be negative three. And therefore, find the particular solution, well, it's, we just have to plug it in, so it's X 
minus 3x natural log x plus 2x squared. And there we go. There we go. All right. Now, on to today's topic in the last few minutes. So, mostly we just want to talk about the idea here is how are we going to approach things when there's an f of x. On the left hand side we're pretty much going to say look it's got to be constant coefficient or we're, we're kind of sunk. So what happens when you have an f of x? What's the procedure? And so there's actually a couple of steps. The first step is, it's actually kind of cool. So what you do is you replace f of x by 0 and you solve the homogeneous differential equation. And so that's the first step. So we, that's why we start by talking about homogeneous. Now you might say, well, why do that? Well, because we're going to get into our second step, which is to say, now we put that f of x back in and find one solution. So we'll call it the particular solution. The solution we find when it's homogeneous, we, we call that the complementary solution. And it's not just like one solution, it's sort of a family of solutions. And so we have n solutions. All right, so, okay, so solve the homogeneous, find one solution, and then we say all the solutions are, combine, are combining those two. Combine the particular solution plus the complementary solution. And now we know what all the solutions look like. And then the last thing is, are there initial conditions? If there are, we solve for the C's. So the C's are used to solve the initial conditions. So y sub p, this particular solution, never varies. It always stays the same. It's the C's that you get to pick to solve for the initial conditions. So that's the idea. Now, you might say, uh, why should we b bother with the homogeneous if we just want a particular solution? The answer is, we're going to learn two techniques next week. Not this week, but next week. One of them is called uh, undetermined coefficients. And it takes a long time to write, write it because it's a very big word, followed by another very big word. And the other technique just so that we know they're different, I'll use different colors, it's called variation of parameters. So these are sort of the two tools that we're going to talk about that say, okay, how can we find the solution, that particular solution? And both of these techniques work by saying we can build off of these complementary solutions. So you have to know the complementary solution to be able to find the particular solution. So that's why you do the homogeneous part first. So the, the punchline here is uh, we can solve more general non-homogeneous differential equations and the process is solve the homogeneous one, find a particular solution, combine, and then life is good. All right, so let's do one example. For the differential equation, y double prime minus 2y prime minus 3y equals 9x, verify that y equals 2 minus 3x is a solution. Find the solution with y of 0 equals 6 and y prime of 0 equals 5. I feel bad because we didn't really get to do one like you work on it. Do you want to do, do this one and then we can come back together or should we just do it together? Just do it together. Like It's about family, Steve. We do it together. All right. So, first to verify. Well, how do you verify something? Plug it in. So we're going to take 2 minus 3x. Second derivative, subtract 2 times 2 minus 3x. First derivative, subtract 3 times 2 minus 3x. And, well, what is the second derivative of 2 minus 3x? Zero. What's the first derivative of 2 minus 3x? Negative 3. And then, well, that's just a function. So 
uh, minus 6 plus 9x. Well, you see, you have a plus 6, minus 6, cancels, so we get 9x. But what should we have gotten? 9x, because that's what we want the right-hand side to be. So we're verified. Good. So this is, I guess, I mentioned two ways you can solve these non-homogeneous. Here's the third way. We give it to you. It's, it's the preferred way among, among students. They say, you know, we prefer the third method among all the methods. Yeah, I understand. All right, so we found a solution. In particular, we would say that y sub p is 2 minus 3x. So it's a particular solution. In other words, it satisfies the non-homogeneous part. All right. So now, what's left? Are we done? Well, if we go back, we've essentially gotten number two out of the way. We found the particular solution. So we found this y sub p, particular solution. So what do we need to find? We need to find this stuff up here, which is what happens when you replace f of x by zero. So we start a side problem y double prime minus 2y prime minus 3y equals 0. So this is the homogeneous differential equation. Well, how do we solve that? Turn it into polynomial, find roots. What's the polynomial? r squared minus 2r minus 3. Does it factor? Please let it factor. Please let it factor. R minus 3, R plus 1. You can check. R squared, uh, a plus R minus 3, R is minus 2, R, and a minus 3. So our roots are 3 and negative 1. So what does our solution look like? Remember, that's our YC. It is? some constant, e to the first root, and these are distinct roots, some constant, e to the second root, times x. All right, so we put this together, and we come to the conclusion that all solutions have the form that you get from adding these two together. So in other words, our, our solution in particular has to, whoops, why did I say equals? It's a very big plus sign. a e to the 3x, b e to the minus x. So to finish up, what do we do? What do we do? Now plug in zero. So we'll need to know y prime. So we take the derivative really quickly. Y of zero, when we plug in zero, we get two, that goes away, plus A, plus B, and that should equal six. Y prime of zero, minus three plus 3a, minus b, and that should equal 5. Or a plus b, move the two across, see now there's this extra part, equals 4, 3a minus b equals 8. All right, we're almost there. What can we do? Add them together and we get 4a equals 12. So A equals, if A equals 3, B equals 1. So our answer 
is 2 minus 3x plus 3e to the 3x plus e to the minus x. All right, good. A little bit of a postscript here. So the punchline is if you plug in your particular solution into there, out comes f of x. If you plug in your complementary solution into the left-hand side, out comes 0. And so why this works is everything's linear. So if you plug in the combination, well, the result is you plug in the particular solution, and that gives you your f of x. And then you plug in your complementary solution, that gives you 0, which gives you f of x. So that's why we're allowed to do this addition there.